Joining me now is Republican Congressman Paul Ryan. He is the chairman of the House Budget Committee, and he crafted the Republican budget proposal that was unveiled last week. The Congressman joins me now from the Capitol. I am pleased to have him here at this moment. Uh, welcome. Charlie, it's great to be back with you. You attended the speech. Um, was it what you expected? Quite honestly, Charlie, it was pretty much the opposite of what I expected. I had thought that with this invitation and this talk about bringing more developments and more of an olive branch on budget, that he was going to extend an olive branch so we can get down the path of bipartisan solutions, and we got anything but that. We got bitter partisanship. We got dramatic distortions of our budget proposal. And, you know, I guess I was thinking at the beginning of the week when he sent his campaign manager out to mention he was going to do this speech, whether there's budget director or his treasury secretary, a little red flag went in my mind, but I kind of disposed of it. But then when I got this speech and we heard this, it was extremely political, very partisan. So I guess what we're going to have to do is do this without the president. We're going to have to talk to our colleagues here in the, in the House, in the Senate, in, the, in Congress, and try and get something done because we're not getting any leadership from the president. And when the president gives these speeches, it's basically a partisan gauntlet. And so we're very disappointed. Um, we thought maybe he was going to do something on Social Security find a way to bridge the gap with us in other areas, but we got nothing but real partisanship and basically a re-election speech. All right, let me talk about some of the things he said. Uh, talking about your plan, he said, but the way this plan achieves those goals would lead to a fundamentally different America than the one we've known throughout most of our history. He said, talked about the cuts you've suggested. He said, these are the kinds of cuts that tell us we can't afford the America we believe in. And they paint a vision, talking of your cuts, of our future that's deeply pessimistic. He said it's a vision that says if our roads crumble and our bridges collapse, we can't afford to fix them. So he continues to collapse to compare your, your vision and his vision, saying that you're presented with a vision from you that says the United States of America, the greatest nation on earth, can't afford any of the things that it should do in terms of building a future. And then finally, he says this vision that says even though Americans can't afford to invest in education or clean energy, even though we can't afford to care for seniors and poor children, we can somehow afford more than one trillion in new tax breaks for the wealthy. He says that's not right and it's not going to happen. Is that the core issue? I don't even know what to say about that. First of all, we're not even talking about cutting taxes. We're talking about keeping tax revenues where they are and cleaning up the, all the junk in the tax code and getting a flatter, fairer, simpler tax system. So we're not talking about cutting taxes. We're, talk we're just not talking about raising taxes like he's proposing. So I guess if we don't go along with his tax increases, that means we're cutting taxes. We want to keep the tax revenues where they are and fix the tax code. And with respect to all that those spending, you know, that partisan spending rhetoric, if you don't fix entitlements, Charlie, if you don't get spending under control, there's not going to be any money left for those other things, for roads, for bridges, for education, for the environment. By fixing the drivers of our debt and getting these entitlement programs saved, sustainable and secure, you free up money for these other priorities in government. If you don't address the drivers of our debt, which clearly the president's not, um, he's not making a proposal to do that, then you don't have money left for everything else. And so I'm amazed that he would use that kind of hyperbolic, hyperventilating rhetoric to describe a plan, which we clearly don't do that. Um, we call our, path, our, our plan a path to prosperity because it's welfare reform to get people back to work. It's economic growth and job creation. It's getting Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security saved. We want to save these programs. And by the way, our, our proposals don't change a single benefit for anybody the age of 55 and above. So if you're in retirement or 10 years away from retiring, no change whatsoever. And we're saving it for the next generation, which, by the way, if you're in my generation, you don't think you're going to get these benefits anyway because that's what the actuaries, actuaries are telling us. And we actually have a plan to pay off this national debt. That's on american giving the, our children a crushing burden of debt, lower standard of living. But he does say that he can save money with health care over the next 10 years by reducing the cost of health care, and that it is more important to reduce the cost of health care than it is to do something uh, that would simply, as he says, threaten uh, a voucher program, yeah. which you don't call it a voucher program, but he says that would threaten the ability of seniors to get health care yeah, believe 10 years from now. Yeah, I actually believe he knows that this is not a voucher program. Um, um, his experts know that this is a premium support program. Vouchers give the money to the person, they go out in the marketplace. That's not what this is. People get a choice. This is 54-year-olds and below. They get a choice of Medicare-approved comprehensive plans to pick from. Then Medicare subsidizes that plan, exactly like the prescription drug benefit works today, just like you know Medicare Advantage would work, or like the plan I have as a congressman. That's what we're talking about. 
Um, but there is a difference of opinion here, and this is where he did show us some acknowledgement of the facts. And the acknowledgement was healthcare costs are going too fast. That's what's bankrupting Medicare and Medicaid, and we've got to deal with this. There's two ways of dealing with this, Charlie. The president just said he wants his IPAB, this unelected bureaucracy, with no oversight or control from Congress to just indiscriminately cut Medicare reimbursements, Medicaid, meaning price controls from government. That doesn't work. We've fought inflation in the past, and price controls don't fight inflation successfully. They just make resources more scarce. They just deny people care. We believe competition is the better way to go. We believe competition and choice is the best way to go after price increases and health inflation. And the reason we say this is the evidence is pretty clear. The prescription drug benefit and the design of which is what we're trying to replicate here, that benefit came in 40% below cost projections because it harnessed the power of choice and competition. Seniors get to choose among a list of Medicare pre-approved plans, and those plans compete against each other for the seniors' business, and that act of competition has resulted in lower premiums and less cost to the taxpayer and better quality for the senior citizen. Do you have a difference in opinion about the social compact uh, between this country and its citizens? I would say uh, yes, and let me explain why. We believe that we need to repair our social safety net. We very much believe we have to have one. And that the social safety net needs to adapt to the 21st century. And that the goal of our social safety net should not be to keep people on welfare, but to get people back on their feet into lives of self-sufficiency. This is why we're saying, let's take a look at the fact we've got 49 different job training programs spread across nine different agencies. Let's collapse them into a career scholarship so people can use that to go back to school to get job training to go back into a career. So we believe that our safety net should be geared toward getting people back on their feet and helping them, and there should be there for people who cannot help themselves, but we don't want a safety net that creates a whole generation of dependency, of complacency. We don't want to turn the safety net into a hammock that lulls people into lives of complacency and dependency that drains them of their incentive and will to make the most of their lives. So the social compact we believe in is upward mobility equality of opportunity, not equality of outcomes. So there is a difference in philosophy here. He says the following, uh, the fact is their vision is less about reducing the deficit than it is about changing the, the social compact. But it makes this point over and over about your proposal coming at you head on. He says there is nothing serious about a plan that claims to reduce the deficit by spending a trillion dollars on tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires. There's nothing courageous about asking for sacrifices from those who can least afford it and don't have any clout on Capitol Hill. And also, this is not a vision of the America I know, said the president. Does that sound like a leader who's trying to bridge partisan gaps? Does that sound like a leader who's trying to get the two parties to come together for bipartisan solutions? Or does that sound some, like somebody who just relaunched his election campaign, who's making partisan arguments? I'll let you be the judge of that, but I would simply say this. Class warfare, I will grant you, can be good politics. Exploiting people's emotions of envy, fear, and anxiety can make for good electoral outcomes. But I got to tell you, Charlie, it's really bad economics. We need to be competitive globally. We tax our businesses a whole lot more than our foreign competitors tax theirs. Got to remember, most small businesses file their taxes as individuals, and most of our jobs come from successful small businesses. So we got to be mindful of the fact that we're not just competing against each other within the states, we're competing against India and China and all these other countries who have lowered their tax rates on their, on their corporations, on their businesses, on but their it, entrepreneurs. He has said, as you know, and even alluded to in this speech, that he wants to reduce the corporate tax at the same the time tax. he wants to do some, the corporate tax, right. Right. But we got to remember, Charlie, most of the jobs come from small businesses who don't file their taxes as corporations. They file their taxes as individuals. So I agree with him on corporate tax reform. So does the Fiscal Commission. There's one area where we seem to have some agreement. But on the class warfare side, trying to, you, you can't get jobs if you go after job creators. You've got to remember, you know, almost three-fourths of our jobs come from small businesses, and they are the ones who pay the individual tax rates. He is proposing in his tax, in his budget, to raise the top tax rate on these successful small businesses to 44.8%. You throw state income tax on top of there, and you are taxing the job creators of America at over 50% in this country, and when our competitors are taxing theirs at about 25%, they win, we lose. We want jobs, we want prosperity, and with higher economic growth and more job creation, you get more revenues to the federal government, and that helps us with our deficits, and that's the path we want to go. 
But aren't you drawing a red line and say, the Republican Party, the Speaker of the House, we will not accept any tax increases at all. And so you were basically saying, we don't want to negotiate on that because we don't believe that that is the way to go. He's essentially saying, I don't want to do what you want to do to Medicare because I don't believe that's the way to go. So how are you going to come together uh, to do something about I mean, what everybody agrees is America's biggest problem? I mean, he said he didn't want to do anything on spending as far as I can tell. I mean, the metrics he put out for this new commission he's creating are less than the metrics he put out for the last commission he created that he disavowed. So I don't know. I, I'm seriously dumbfounded as to where we get a bipartisan agreement. I was led to believe by some Democrats that he was going to offer a Social Security reform plan today. And I was very excited about that. I thought that's why he invited us to his speech today. So I thought, oh, my gosh, this is an opportunity for us to come together as two parties to fix one of the problems we have, which is an insolvent Social Security system. And we didn't get any of that. We got this partisanship. So I don't know where a solution is to behold. As you well know, the president in his State of the Union, as well as uh, at every opportunity he has, talks about winning the future. And he suggests that we cannot win the future if we do not make investments in education, in science, in a whole series of areas in which he says countries that are competing with the United States are doing. South Korea, he mentioned in his speech today. I think investment is another euphemism for more spending. Um, look, 42 cents on every dollar government spends today is borrowed money. Half of that borrowed money comes from other countries, number one of, of which is China. You can't sustain a viable economy, win the future, if you've got to rely on other foreign countries to cash flow your government. We've got to get the spending under control. And then as we do that, we have to prioritize spending. Under our budget, spending on education increases. Under our budget, Spending on Medicare increases every single year. Under our budget, spending on Medicaid increases. Under our budget, spending increases. It doesn't increase at the fast clip that the president wants it to, but the reason it doesn't is because we don't want to keep relying on all this borrowed money. We want to get the, get, get the deficits down, get the deficits paid off, so we can get on the business of paying off the debt. And under our bill, according to the Congressional Budget Office, not only do we end up balancing the budget, we pay off the debt itself. It takes time. But we do that under the CBO's analysis of the president's budget. He doubles our publicly held debt with, by the end of his first term, his term, and then he triples it by the end of his budget window. The president doesn't come anywhere close to getting the deficits down to what they rate as a sustainable level, let alone get the deficit under control, the debt under control. And so you've, you've got to remember, Charlie, today's high deficits and debt mean to entrepreneurs and businesses and job creators more tax increases and higher interest rates tomorrow. So showing that we're not getting this under control shows the economy that it's going to be an ugly road. Don't invest in the future. Don't win the future. We've got to show that we're getting these deficits and debt under control, which are driven high by spending so that we can get job creation today. So yes, deficit spending cuts and deficit reduction is good for job creation today because it shows the world the entrepreneurs, the small businessmen and women of America, the credit markets, that we're getting our act together, we're getting our situation under control, and that they're not going to have crushingly high taxes and interest rates to pay for this mess we've created. Can you bring yourself to say the President of the United States and Congressman Paul Ryan agree about the serious economic situation that this country faces? We agree that there is an economic crisis unless we do something about our debt, and all we have is two people, two ideas that are in collision about what to do about it. Because he has in this speech and recently recognized that there have to be spending cuts. That was part of the deal that was made recently. So the president seems to be saying, I understand we've got to cut spending. I understand the problem of the deficit, but we simply have a difference of opinion to get to essentially the same numbers. Well, Reduction I would, of four trillion in 10 years. I don't think that's correct. I mean, here's why I say this, Charlie, and, and with all respect to the president, we put out a pl an actual plan. We put out a specific plan that does what we say it will do, that pays off this debt, that balances the budget, that gets the economy growing and preserve Medicare, Medicaid, the safety net, and all of those things. The president has given us speeches, he's given us platitudes, and he's given us commissions. Right. He hasn't given us a plan to fix this. His own budget, according to the Washington Post, punts and ducks on this issue. 
So he has yet to give us an actual plan that actually fixes the problem. So we don't have competing plans. We really don't have competing ideas. We have an actual plan that we have put out there using our principles of growth and opportunity and prosperity, of welfare reform, and we have his speeches. We don't have a plan. So you really can't say that there's plan A and plan B. Let's split the difference. There's plan A, our plan, and there's no other plan from the president. Why, why do you think he's not offering more specifics? I don't know. I really, I honestly don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I literally thought today that's what he was going to do. And that's why I'm really pretty disappointed. I thought we were going to get some specifics. And so we got this campaign speech. So I, I honestly don't know. I mean, I, I know he sees the numbers. I know he knows the numbers. I know his economic advisors are telling him about what a debt crisis looks like. Here's the way I look at this, Charlie. I was involved in the 2008, uh, in the crisis management of the 2008 crash, you know, the fiscal, the financial crisis, which created the recession. I was involved in that TARP legislation, really ugly legislation. Nobody enjoyed that moment. That thing caught us by surprise, Charlie. We didn't see it coming. And what happened? Millions of people lost their jobs and trillions of dollars of wealth was lost out of people's savings nest eggs. This crisis we see coming. This one is the most predictable economic crisis we've ever had. We know it's coming. More importantly, we know why it's coming, generally when it's happening. We know what we need to do to prevent it from happening. But we don't have leadership around here to tackle this challenge, to prevent it from happening. We decided not to wait around for the president to act. We decided to act. And no, obviously he doesn't like the way we do it. I would argue that he dramatically distorts what we do. He doesn't like what he, we're doing. He doesn't like what his commission did. But then you would think a leader would propose his alternative, and he hasn't done that. He's proposing another commission. So we well, just think he's we done, have a moral done, obligation to with, act. With respect, he has done more than just simply uh, suggest a new commission. I mean, he really has, in a sense, given you a philosophical base, you know, and made uh, some criticism of your proposals uh, and suggested some direction that he wants to go in. A lot of other people are demanding yeah, but there's no specifics. more facts. There's no, all Agreed. I know is he wants to have iPad do more, which is more rationing of Medicare. All I know is he wants the government to take decisions away from Congress on how Medicare runs and give it to the Department of Health and Human Services and let them twist the screw, screws and ration care. That's the only idea I got out of him today that actually really saves money. Um, in discretionary spending, you know, we had this agreement. Um, he before wanted to spend more than that. So the only concrete entitlement reform idea I got from him today was, yes, Medicare spending is unsustainable and it's got to be addressed. So he agrees with us on that. And then he wants to do, had this unelected bureaucracy, um, just do price controls. That's the only idea we've gotten from him. And, and that's it. And we got to do, a, there's a lot more you have to do than that, which I don't agree with that, to fix this mess and prevent a debt crisis from hitting this country. Let me talk about the debt ceiling. Um, it seems that the administration wants to separate it out and treat it as, as an issue alone. Are you prepared to do that? No, I think what, what we want to do is make sure, because this is the only game in town, so to speak. It's the only must-pass piece of legislation. Right. As we consider the debt limit, we want to attach spending cuts and spending controls and reforms to it. We see this as an opportunity because we're not sure that the Senate's going to pass a budget this year. I just really don't know the answer to that question. So if the budget's not going to go anywhere, then the debt limit is, and we want to use that as an opportunity to get a down payment on spending cuts. Now, the reason the debt limit is being hit right now is because of all the past spending that went out the door. So we want to get a down payment on lowering future spending um, to try and deal with the debt that way. And, and so I just don't agree with the premise that we just got to raise the debt limit with no conditions, with nothing, and then let's keep talking. Well, the talking hasn't gotten us anywhere, and we want to get to the actual spending cuts and controls. And we think that the markets re would reward us for that. That would be helpful for interest rates and everything else. You have suggested uh, that the president didn't even take into account the, the debt commission that he appointed, of which you were a member. Uh, yes, you and did I put not dozens agree. of the recommendations in my budget. Uh, but you also... And the president had failed to subscribe to it, but he did suggest that there were certain aspects of it that he would support. Yes, we're st he, he didn't in his budget. He says that there are certain aspects he would support now. Um, we'll find out what exactly those are. Our tax reforms are along their model of lowering rates, broadening the base. I put dozens of the, of the uh, debt commission's recommendations in our budget. And then because I voted against the debt commission, because I didn't think it did enough for health and retirement security reform, um, I put out my own alternative. We put out our own ideas, and we're still waiting for the president to do that, to put out a budget that actually fixes the problem. He hasn't done that. 
who has the next move? You know, we're just going to keep working. You know, I, we're just going to keep working. There's a lot of partisanship that's now ramped up and flying around here. We're going to go back to work. We're going to pass this continuing resolution agreement that gets the it's, the, it's the most historic size spending cut. We're doing that Thursday, then Thursday night and Friday we're going to do the budget. We're going to pass our budget. We're going to roll up our sleeves, get to work, and try and save this country from going into a debt crisis. We're hoping for partners on the other side of the aisle. Right now we're getting political broadsides, but we just can't let that deter us. And then hopefully at the end of the day, cooler heads will prevail and we can get something done. Congressman Paul Ryan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank Pleasure. you, Charlie. You've been very patient. Appreciate it.